Imagine a world where everyone was addicted to violent video games and constantly watching the sleaziest content imaginable. No, I'm not talking about present day 2024. I'm talking about Gamer, where players use death row inmates to take the word deathmatch to a whole new level. Whether you're getting fragged or getting freaky, Ken Castle's virtual world has a little something for everyone. But what's just fun in games for the players becomes life or death for the real human avatars that they control. We're here to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the VR death game in Gamer. This billionaire is about to take over the entire world, and only one man can stop him. At some point in the near future, billboards advertising a viral video game called Slayers dare viewers from all around the world to tune in and join the bloodshed. But this is no ordinary game. In Slayers, real people are used as avatars, controlled by their players in an online deathmatch, and one gladiator named Cable is just four wins away from earning his freedom. As the night's match begins, Cable rushes through the alleyways surrounding an abandoned factory, dodging massive explosions and moving from cover to cover as he drops one opponent after another with the precision of a trained soldier. The only thing slowing him down is the lag that pops up between the controls built into Cable's brain and the kid who's controlling him but he's able to push through to the factory, bringing him one step closer to finally escaping the game once and for all. Inside, the place is already a total disaster, with other players running around fragging and teabagging each other all while some huge dude with a heavy machine gun just unloads into the chaos from above. Cable fights his way up to an elevated catwalk, where he drops several more bad guys up close and personal. With only 100 meters left until he reaches the save point, there's a close call when Cable notices someone sneaking up on him before his player catches on. But he tells the kid out loud to turn him around and ends up saving his own life at the last second. The shots get the attention of more enemy players who toss a grenade up there and send Cable flying out of a window. But this ends up working to his advantage as he's able to pull himself to his feet and stagger to the safety of the final save point surviving this round and making one match down with three more to go. Okay, Cable definitely has the skills to pay the bills, but even as good as he is, there's no denying that he had a few close calls towards the end of the match. It sure would suck for him to make it this far just to lose when he's three minutes away from freedom, so Cable and his player Simon really need to nail down their strategy if they're going to give him the best possible chance of surviving the final round. Okay, so before we get too far into it, I have a potential solution to all of Cable's problems. Forget rescuing Angie and instead maybe strike up a conversation with someone a, a little more attainable, someone more digital. And that's where today's sponsor comes in. I want to introduce you to Poly AI, an app that will blow your mind and unleash your inner chatterbox. Think of it as a place where fictional characters come to life, joke around, or even embark on epic adventures with you. Poly AI lets you unleash your creativity and build your own AI chatbot, complete with a unique personality and voice. It can be anyone you can imagine. <laughs> Why are you looking at me like that? No, seriously, it really is that easy. Let's create Ken Castle, the villain from the movie Gamer, and uh, ask him a few questions about why he's such a Chad. Identity. Evil tech billionaire with plans on controlling the human race. All right, boom. Ah, the motherfucker just said, greetings. Hey man, so tell me all about your plans for world domination. Well, my plans are quite simple. I will use my nanites to infect the entire human race. So this app is dope because you get to chat with villains from movies, which if you're like me, is something that I've always wanted to do. Like, I've always wanted to ask the shark from Jaws, why are you so hungry? I'm a shark, we're always hungry, how about that? And let's face it, if the characters in Gamer had this, then they wouldn't need society or slayers. But on the real, sometimes real life conversations can be awkward, I don't know, trust me. I sit here talking to myself all day. The thing about Poly AI is you can practice your social skills. It's like having your own personal hype man ready to boost your confidence and entertain you whenever you need it. Oh, you thought the fun stopped there? Think again. 
Poly AI also features a fantastic option called mods. These mods basically act like mini adventures where you can interact with your characters in specific scenarios. Literally, what are you waiting for? Go to the link in the description and use my code BEAT66 to download the Poly app today and get access to Poly AI Plus. With over 1 million downloads worldwide, it's easy to see that Poly is the place to be. Join today and start the conversation. Thanks to Poly AI for sponsoring today's video and now, Back to the show. The most important thing that can help us here is understanding the key aspects of the game, like what Cable's overall objectives are and what elements of the game are working against him. We never get an exact explanation of the rules, but from what we just saw here, it seems like the game isn't just a straight up deathmatch. Getting kills gets you points for fame and to upgrade your gear, but what really matters is surviving long enough to reach the save point, which is when you're able to safely get out of the round. Your overall kill count and score at the end of the game don't seem to matter as much as making it to the objective still in one piece. Since there's no respawns, this means that we should shift our strategy over from getting kills to carefully trying to avoid danger whenever we can. And uh, there are a few ways that Cable can make this work. First, we know that the game isn't a free-for-all and that the players seem to be separated into at least two opposing teams. Since Cable is so good, a lot of the other avatars and their players might listen to what he says. So instead of letting them all keep running around like crazy, he should try to organize his team like that scene from Gladiator and get them to work together to survive the round. He does have to be careful who he trusts though, because there's always the option for friendly fire. And the closer that he gets to victory, the better the chances become that someone might try to sabotage him. But getting everyone on the same team would dramatically increase their effectiveness in battle, which equals a better chance of winning for Cable than just doing everything on his own. As an added bonus, this also means that he can use his teammates as meat shields by always making sure that he lets a few other players go up ahead of him. This way, they can clear areas or alert him when enemies are present. And if things start to look bad, then he can just use them for live cover while he finds a safer path. Everyone in the game also comes equipped with a loadout of personalized gear that they're allowed to upgrade between rounds. Since Cable here already has a solid weapon, his players should focus on upgrades that are defensive or stealth oriented instead, like a bulletproof vest or some camouflage that can help him blend in with his environment. Of course, less kills means less points for upgrades, but Cable's player Simon is already seriously rich and now also famous from his success in the game. This means he can use his own money or set up a way for his viewers to donate directly to him so that he can fund better upgrades for his avatar. There's no way that a game like this doesn't have microtransactions and pay to win mechanics where he can use real money to make Cable stronger. So this might be a way for him to offset the decrease in upgrade points from switching to a more team play focused style. Outside of the game itself, Simon can also use his money to upgrade his internet connection and minimize lag as much as possible, which would give them both a huge advantage over the other players with bad connections. Now, Cable and Simon don't only have to play by the rules of the game. If they really want an unfair advantage, then they can look into their options for using hacks to make Cable more effective, like giving him an unofficial cold-blooded perk that makes him invisible to other players. It might not be fair for everyone else, but when we're talking about the difference between life or death, does being fair really matter anymore? The biggest thing to worry about is that they don't get caught cheating, since that's a pretty big risk to take when you're already this close to winning fair and square. Altering the code of the game is actually going to play a big part in the story later, but Simon and Cable won't be the only ones using cheat codes and things are only going to get more dangerous the closer that he gets to freedom. Meanwhile, on the outside world, the mastermind behind it all, evil genius computer programmer Ken Castle, is about to give his first talk show interview in almost 10 years. The host, Gina, starts off the show with a breakdown of Castle's first game, Society. It's basically like a second life type of virtual world where real people can work as avatars for a paycheck but have absolutely no control over what the players do with them while they're in the game. And you already know that they make them do some seriously f***ed up stuff. 
Society made Castle the richest man in the world, but it wasn't until he came up with Slayers that things officially turned deadly. For this game, all of the avatars are actually death row inmates, who volunteer for the challenge in hopes of winning their freedom by surviving 30 matches. So far, nobody has even gotten close, but Cable and his player Simon have captured the world's attention by being the first pair to ever make it this far. Not every inmate is up for the challenge, but they still have the chance to play for their freedom by filling in the role of an NPC. These guys only have to survive one round to get out, but the catch is that they're limited to a set of pre-programmed behaviors and have no control over their own actions during the round. As for the controls, they work something like this. Castle here developed specialized nano cells that, once implanted in a person's brain, self-replicate until there are enough of them floating around in the avatar Avatar's cortex for a player to take remote control over their physical actions. Although the procedure is permanent, the system only works while the avatar is in the play area, and they're given back full control over their bodies once their shift in the game world ends. But there's a team of hackers out there who have a different idea about what Castle here really has planned. As they cut to commercial in the studio, the broadcast is suddenly hijacked by a group of hackers who call themselves the Humans. The group's leader, who goes only by the codename Brother, warns the viewers that Castle's promise of a safer world is all just a trick, and that everyone in the world will become his mind-controlled pawns if they don't do something about it soon. Castle here treats this all like a funny joke, and immediately goes back to creeping on the show's host without taking the hackers seriously. But, as you can probably guess, this was his biggest mistake. While they're not in the game, Cable and the other prisoners are forced to work in the salt mines, where every moment is just as dangerous as the competition itself. Unlike some of the others, he's able to stay out of trouble by quietly sitting on the sidelines and minding his own business. But there's this one guy, Freak, who eventually catches on. One day, Freak here decides to sit down for a chat, but it ends up being a pretty one-sided conversation, with Cable keeping up his strong, silent-type persona, all while fighting back flashbacks to the incident that landed him on death row. Later that night, while Cable is in his cell, a mysterious woman comes by and drops in a picture of his wife and daughter, Angie and Delia, who are both still waiting for him on the outside. She whispers that she knows how the hope of seeing them again is the only thing keeping keeping Cable here alive, before handing in a piece of paper and asking him to autograph it for her son. Cable gives his signature, but as he goes to give the paper back, the woman suddenly takes a blood sample from his hands, before quickly disappearing again without any explanation of who she is or what she really wants. Okay. It looks like Cable here still has people on the outside rooting for him even though he's on death row. Now that we've heard from the game's designer, we might have just learned a few important details that could give Cable, Simon, and the hackers a huge advantage. Even if he doesn't realize that they're all on the same team just yet. Castle here may be the smartest guy on the planet, but so far he's up his own ass and there must be a way to turn his own system against him. He's convinced that his servers for Slayers and society are untouchable. But uh, history has shown that if there's any way to hack a system, then it's only a matter of time before somebody figures it out. Back when the very first iPhones came out in 2007, their new iOS system was supposed to be one of the most secure in the industry. Well, it only took a matter of two months before a 17-year-old hacker found a way to jailbreak them, allowing him and countless other iPhone users to install third-party apps and do all kinds of other stuff that wasn't officially approved by Apple. Those were the days. Anyways, if one kid can do something like that alone in his parents' basement, then an organized hacker group with multiple people all working together should be able to cause some serious trouble for Cable and his company. They just need to know where to direct their attention. For Cable and his competition in Slayers, we can use these hacker skills to give him an unfair advantage in combat like we mentioned before. After listening to Cable's interview, we now know that every avatar in the game is given their own IP address. Basically, an IP or internet protocol address is like a unique name that's assigned to each device, or in this case, each avatar, that's connected to a network. These IPs are then used to route data packets between the devices, which is how the player gives inputs to the 
Avatar, and how they receive information like what the Avatar sees and hears back to their end of the screen. Every action that an Avatar takes generates a data packet containing the IP. So if a player like Simon were to download a packet capturing tool that intercepted these messages, then they could use it to track all of the other Avatar's locations around the map in real time. Like giving Cable a permanent UAV in the next match. This would obviously be a huge help for Cable, but like we mentioned before, something like this might be considered cheating, and it could still be risky if they end up getting caught. Now, as for the humans, if they really want to take Castle down, then the best way to do it would be to go after one of his biggest revenue streams, the Game Society. Instead of letting a bunch of degenerates continue to line his pockets, they could flood the system with bot players that don't make the avatars do anything at all. This would prevent some players from accessing the game, and the ones that still got through would quickly get annoyed with the non-interactive avatars clogging up the system hopefully leading them to quit the game altogether. Castle may be the face of the operation, but he admitted himself that he gets a lot of help from his tech team. I'd guess that he probably doesn't treat his employees all that great just based on his personality. So if the humans could find a disgruntled worker and flip them, then they'd have even more help to take the system down from the inside. If they can take advantage of Castle's ego and find a way to exploit any flaws in his system, then they might be able to bring his empire down for good. But he's got a few tricks left up his sleeve that aren't going to make it easy. Eventually, it's time for the next match to start, this time taking place in an abandoned city where Castle has sent in his own squad of attack helicopters as a way to add some extra challenge. Cable himself isn't entertained by the needless violence and chaos that's unfolding all around him, but he knows that he has to keep going if he ever wants to see his family again. With no other choice, he begins to make his way across the battlefield, eliminating any opponents who get in his way, and passing by a spot where an enemy with a flamethrower is brutally burning a bunch of avatars on a nearby overpass. It's like the most brutal war zone that the world has ever seen. And the whole time, there's a handful of NPC characters just wandering around, hoping not to get killed in the crossfire. Seeing one is about to get hit by a truck, Cable's player puts his life on the line by diving in front of the vehicle to save her. But it's all just a waste of time, because a second later, she gets right back up and walks into the road again, where she's immediately run over by the ice cream man instead. Cable rushes down the street easily stacking up over 10 kills. Luck plays a part in it as well, as another player from his team saves him from a sniper in the window, only to then get her head completely blown off just a few seconds later. It's a tough break for her, but there's no time to waste, and Cable continues fighting his way from block to block, avoiding explosions and taking out whoever he has to until he finally makes it to the save point and finishes the round. By now, Cable's body count is well over 100 other inmates, and all around the world, viewers from every country are celebrating his latest victory, with just two more games left to go until he finally earns his freedom. On the train ride back to prison, one of the other inmates starts tweaking out, completely losing his sanity as he wonders who's really controlling them. For Cable, his player is this douchey rich kid, Simon, who basically just sits in his VR room goofing around online all day. In between matches, he picks out a few sick new upgrades for Cable, a new ammo type for his grenade launcher called Swarmers that fires an airburst cluster of heat-seeking micro-missiles. After ducking some calls from an army of fangirls who are trying to get a piece of him and Cable, he's suddenly interrupted when the hackers take over his screen, offering him an extension that he can use to speak directly with his avatar in real time. Despite the promise of earning their freedom, the truth is that nobody was ever supposed to win all 30 rounds. And Castle here has just hatched a devious plan to cut Cable's winning streak short just before he escapes. It's time to introduce Hackman, a giant convict with a secret weapon that no other avatar has. He's the only one who's fully in control of his own actions, without the deadly lag that comes when you have a player pulling the strings, and his only objective is to frag Cable by any means necessary. Freak gives Cable the rundown, explaining how Hackman apparently killed a bunch of people on the outside world, 
and then just turned himself in like he wanted to be in the game. But with only two more matches to go, he refuses to let this new terrifying opponent get in his head. While they're out on the range testing out Cable's new upgrades, the guard asks him an interesting question. Who's really in control, the player or the avatar? Cable explains that it depends on the player, but no matter how skilled they are, there's always a slight delay between their input and the avatar's actions. As for him and Simon, the secret to their success is that Simon allows Cable to be in control when he needs to, cutting out the split-second delay that costs other avatars their lives in the heat of battle, and relying on Cable's natural instincts as a soldier to pull them through. Okay, well damn. As if things weren't bad enough already, they actually set Cable up with a real life boss battle for his last few rounds. This guy is the most dangerous opponent that Cable has ever had to face. And if he wants to see his family again, then he and Simon are going to have to use every advantage that they can to get him through this next challenge alive. First, let's start off by comparing our two avatars' overall battle experience. On one hand, Cable here is a trained soldier with exponential combat skills that have allowed him to survive almost 30 rounds, something that nobody else has ever done before. On the other hand, we know that Hackman is a bloodthirsty killer, which makes him extremely dangerous, no doubt. But his aggressive playstyle and lack of in-game experience might also turn out to be his greatest weakness. Then we have their weapons of choice. Cable is using the G6KV, a medium-range weapon with a 100-round drum, whereas Hackman picked up the Saiga 12, a 12-gauge shoddy with a 20-shell capacity. Hackman's weapon is devastating at closer range, but Cable's longer range and higher capacity should give him the upper hand as long as he keeps his opponent at a distance. Hackman's greatest advantage of all is that he isn't being controlled by anyone but himself, and therefore doesn't have the same problem of deadly lag popping up between a player's commands and his own actions. This is a huge help for him but now that Cable and Simon can talk, they actually have a unique avatar of their own that could turn out to be even more helpful. They say that two heads are better than one, and what's really special here is that Simon can actually see the battlefield from a third person point of view. In a battle royale, playing in third person gives you a lot of advantages over the players who choose to go the first person route. Not only can you get a big picture view of the battlefield, but you can also use this pulled back perspective to see over cover and around corners without actually exposing your avatar, allowing Simon and Cable to wall peek Hackman before he can even see them. This is a huge advantage that could make taking him out almost too easy, and not using it would be a massive waste of a good opportunity. Now, although Hackman is in control of his own actions, he does still have the Nanex link just like everyone else. Only Castle can control him right now, but if someone from the human's side could hack into the servers and make themselves Hackman's player, then this would open up all kinds of possibilities to either deliberately sabotage him, or even better, use him to actually help Cable fight alongside him. In the next match, Simon should use his third-person perspective to act as a second set of eyes, and allow Cable to have as much control over the fighting part of things as possible. Since his actual military training will be more useful than Simon's gamer skills any day of the week, the safest bet would be to try to avoid Hackman altogether. Next best play would be to use his bloodthirstiness and Simon's unrestricted viewpoint against him, and lure him into a trap to to kill him when he thinks that he actually has the advantage. He may be scary, but they can still pull off the win if they play it smart. The only problem is that Castle doesn't plan on playing fair either way. Later on, while Cable is cleaning up in the showers, Hackman finds him and starts to taunt him, revealing that he just killed another inmate for no reason other than it was fun for him to do. He says that he's going to do the same thing for Cable once the match starts, and when he's finished, he threatens to pay a visit to his family on the outside too. As if things weren't bad enough already, he now has to win to stop this guy from finding his wife and daughter, but Castle and his team aren't going to make it easy. Before before the next round starts, Simon begins to speak to Cable, thanks to the new plugin, who's surprised to be hearing from the person behind the screen for the first time. The round takes place inside of a motocross course turned into a war zone, and while he's taking cover behind some cars, Cable starts to get frustrated that Simon isn't taking the game seriously enough. 
the two of them start off strong, easily dropping one opponent after another, when all of a sudden, Cable spots Freak playing as an NPC sweeping up trash in the middle of the battlefield. He tries to warn him to get out of there, but Freak can't control his own actions. And in a matter of seconds, another avatar comes along and uses him as a meat shield, with Cable watching as the only friend that he has left is torn apart in a hail of bullets. Simon here cracks a joke, refusing to feel bad even when Cable reminds him that these are real humans, because he knows that they're all just death row inmates who probably just had it coming anyway. They eventually end up on an empty street, where Cable tries to get Simon to take him into an area that's beyond the borders of the game. Someone opens fire on them while they're standing out in the open, but when Cable takes cover behind a nearby van, he's suddenly ambushed by Hackman, who smacks the weapon out of his hand and takes him down with a metal club. For a second, it looks like it's all over for Cable. But when Hackman goes to pull the trigger, for some reason, his weapon refuses to fire. At the same time, they're taken down by a group of Castle's friends for being out of bounds. But just before he's taken away, Cable tells Simon that he needs to give him full control if they're actually going to win the game. After getting kicked out of the round, Simon is shopping for more upgrades when the hackers tune in for another chat. This time, it's Brother himself who wants to know if Simon is going to give Cable what he wants, and let him take full control during the next match. According to him, Cable knows secrets about Castle's operation that he really doesn't want going public, which is why Castle is pulling out all the stops to kill him before he wins his 30th battle. Simon still isn't convinced, but after Brother reminds him that if Cable dies, then his 15 minutes of fame will be over as well, he starts to see the bigger picture, and finally agrees to play along with their plan. Okay, Cable totally should have been dead here, but once again, dumb luck ended up saving the day. The only reason that he's still alive is because Hackman's weapon wouldn't fire, and we might actually be able to learn something here that could help us out in the next match. First, we've seen a few times now that every weapon used in the matches has the same electronic locking mechanism attached to it. This prevents the weapon from firing unless the organizers turn it off, and since they're controlling them from a remote location, we can logically figure out that there must be some kind of wireless communication system involved. If the humans could find a way to intercept these signals, then they could find out what commands the organizers are sending that lock or unlock the weapons. With that knowledge, then they'd be able to remotely lock out anyone's weapon, including Hackman's, giving him a cheat code that would pretty much instantly win any fight. We have to ask why Castle chose to stop him right before he was actually about to do it. What makes sense to me is that Cable here went out of bounds into a restricted area, which could mean that the weapons just don't work unless you're on the battlefield. We know that Castle is also relying on the spectacle of Hackman being the one to take Cable out. And for that, the kill needs to happen in front of an audience. The smart move here might be to stay near the boundaries of the map where the cameras have a harder time seeing the action thereby denying Castle the glory kill that he's counting on to have Hackman replace Cable as the new favorite slayer in the eyes of the fans. To add to this, the humans could hack into the cameras and force them to cut away whenever Hackman is around, since if he's not on camera, then Castle can't get his big finale moment. It's not much, but anything that they can do to mess up Castle's plans will only buy Cable more time until he can escape. And sometimes, it's better to give yourself any advantage that you can before trying to face off with a guy like Hackman head on. At the prison, the same mysterious woman comes to visit Cable for the second time, saying that she's a friend who wants to help him get out. He's still confident that he can win his freedom fair and square, but the woman says that Castle has things set up so that winning will be impossible, and his only chance of seeing his family again is to escape the game altogether. After thinking it over, Cable tells the woman that he needs her to smuggle in some alcohol, having just come up with a plan of his own to turn the tables against Cable and his team. Later, as everyone's gearing up for the next match, Cable reaches into his vest and finds what he was looking for, a small bottle of some cheap-ass vodka. Cracking the lid, he lifts it to his mouth and chugs the entire thing down just as the round is about to start. But this is more than just a plan to get turned up before his final battle. The match starts, and Cable staggers out onto the battlefield, barely able to keep his feet under him as he drunkenly combat rolls 
rolls around from cover to cover. This dude is absolutely blasted, and Simon starts to think that giving him control was a bad idea after all, but he has no idea that this is all according to Cable's master plan. Even though he's stumbling around like a freshman at a frat party, he manages to make it to a parking garage still in one piece, where he finds a badass pickup truck that's calling his name. And that's when he starts vomiting up all of the alcohol into its gas tank. It's enough to get the engine running, and not a moment too soon either, because here comes Hackman spraying bullets at him like he just unlocked the infinite ammo glitch. The guy leaps onto the driver's side door as he's speeding away, but Cable manages to lose him when he cuts too close to a cement column, knocking him to the ground before he can make the kill. Outside, Cable speeds through the city in his new whip, taking out a drone that cuts off Simon's feed. He's almost out of the play zone when a team of mercenaries in a giant dump trunk starts trying to run him off the road, and although he manages to lose them, he eventually has to sacrifice his own truck to get beyond the boundary. Crawling out of the vehicle, he rushes to cover, just as a Predator missile blows up the truck to smithereens, and the news reports that Cable has been fragged, but the truth is that's exactly what he wants them to think. Okay, well, that was definitely one of the plans of all time. You might be wondering how the hell Cable even managed to survive all of that. But what we didn't see is behind the scenes. Simon secretly picked up the plot armor perk before the start of this round. He might have made it through in one piece, but Cable, my man, this was awfully close to a serious you f***ed up. Now, if I'm being honest, your plan here was actually pretty damn smart. It was the execution of the plan that was risky as hell. The chances of that amount of alcohol actually starting a truck are slim to none to begin with, since even though it does contain ethanol, the water and other additives in vodka make it much less effective as a fuel source compared to regular gasoline. That's the first problem, but the method that you used to get it there was the craziest part of all. At almost 200 pounds, consuming that much alcohol that quickly would land you with a blood alcohol content of 0.44, which is considered to be potentially lethal. Even if you could handle the effects, getting absolutely blasted in the middle of a full-on battle royale would be pretty much guaranteed to get anyone else killed within about 15 seconds of the match starting. You easily could have just taken the bottle in with you instead, and then you wouldn't have been completely hammered as you're trying to fight for your life. If you got shot and the bottle got broken, then you'd have some bigger problems on your hands anyway, so there really was no reason to take it out of its perfectly good container and transport it all the way across the battlefield in your belly instead. Or here's a crazy idea. How about next time you just ask the lady to bring you a bottle of gasoline instead? Ever think about that one? Using this moment to fake your death was a good idea, but even even though the public might be tricked, Castle is still going to know that you're out there, and that means that it's only a matter of time before Hackman comes back for revenge. You needed this opportunity to take him out for good, but missing that chance could end up costing you down the line. Congratulations on finally making it out of the game at least, but the next time that your master plan relies on getting f***ed up literally, it might help to try brainstorming some other ideas first. There's at least one person in the media who isn't buying it, Gina, the talk show host. And she realizes that if Cable here is still alive, then he'll most likely be going for his wife, Angie, next. She ends up being 100% correct, as Cable is already outside of their old apartment waiting for any sign of her. But instead, this biker chick, Trace, shows up and tells him that he needs to be more careful before Castle's men catch him. It turns out that this is the girl who was visiting him in his cell, and she quickly takes him over to the group's headquarters on the other side of the city, where the rest of the humans are all waiting to meet him. After getting his introduction to Brother and the rest of the group, the first thing that Cable wants to know is what were they doing with his blood sample? They explain that every avatar has a unique connection to the Nanex, so they needed his DNA to create a specific code that will allow them to disable the nanites controlling his brain. The way that they see it, it's only a matter of time before Castle starts using his nanites to control everyone in the world, not just the people on Death Row and they need Cable's help to stop it. But first things first, Cable needs to save his wife, and they know exactly where he can find her. Angie here is in society clocking in for another shift when she's abruptly approached by this seriously perverted guy, Rick. 
Within minutes, the creeps controlling them take them both back to Angie's apartment. But just as they're about to get their freak on, they're suddenly interrupted when Cable lunges out from behind the couch and completely obliterates this dude's back. Bane style before throwing him across the room like a sack of potatoes. Grabbing Angie's hand, Cable rushes her back to the elevator, but when the doors open, they find Hackman already waiting for them on the other side. As he blasts Cable point blank in the chest before taking Angie and shutting down the doors. Luckily, Cable manages to survive thanks to the bulletproof vest that he was wearing. So when Hackman and Angie reach the lobby, he starts beating the absolute crap out of him and even blows a couple of his toes off before escaping as a team of Castle's agents start to close in. Disoriented, Cable asks his wife where they can hide, but since the creepy guy is still controlling her, he ends up leading them straight into another massive rave. They try to keep a low profile and blend in with the crowd, but Castle's men quickly finds them and opens fire. Cable manages to take a few of them down, all while the other avatars never even stop partying, and they make a narrow escape through a back exit at the other end of the club. Outside, they end up running into the reporter Gina here, who offers them a ride back to the humans' headquarters, and Cable hesitantly accepts, even though he isn't 100% sure that they can trust her. They make it back without any trouble, but they still have to keep Angie sedated until they can crack her Nanex link. Otherwise, Castle and his henchmen can use her eyes to see right into their headquarters. While they're waiting for the mod to take effect, they decide to hack into Cable's repressed memories and find out what really happened that landed him in prison. It turns out that he was part of a top secret government experiment and the first test subject of Castle's Nanex technology. In the final step of the trials, Kane's superiors used their mind control to make him shoot the only other test subject, tying up any loose ends and sending Cable to death row so that his story would never reach the light of day. The others realize that this is the key to finally taking down Castle's empire. But as for Cable and Angie, they're still missing the most important piece of their family, their daughter Delia who was placed into foster care when he went to prison. Until now, they've had no idea who adopted her, but the humans have just discovered that the girl is actually living with Castle himself, and that's when Cable finally realizes what he has to do. Okay, it's officially time for the final showdown, but before Cable goes in, I want to point out something important that he and the humans seem to be missing. If they can unmind control Cable, then maybe they can reverse mind control the other avatars as well. And what they don't realize is that this also applies to Castle himself. In the real world, it isn't uncommon for big tech CEOs like Castle here to be the first ones to try out their products, and he's no exception to the rule. Mark Zuckerberg was one one of the very first people to have a Facebook account. And Steve Jobs would always be the first to use and demonstrate new Apple products before they entered the consumer market. As for Castle, he's had his own Nanex connections since he first came up with the procedure, and exploiting this could be his greatest weakness. What they need to do is reverse engineer a code for Castle that would allow them to take control over his brain. They'll need his DNA to do it, but some saliva from a cup of coffee or a used lollipop should be enough to do the trick. And since he seems to have a thing for Gina here, they could use her to get in close and get what they need. He's going to be expecting Cable to show up, but just when Castle thinks that he has him right where he wants him, the humans could use their code to spring the trap, activating the mind control and making it impossible for Castle to fight back. The best part is, he's so cocky that he would never even see it coming. It's a great plan if they're able to pull it off, but Cable prefers to do things the old-fashioned way, and now it's time to see who's able to come out on top. That night, Cable arrives at Castle's compound for the final showdown and finds the front door suspiciously wide open as if they were already expecting him. Inside, he doesn't have to look far before he finds his daughter sitting at the end of one of the halls. But when he rushes over to help her, he runs straight into a screen, revealing that it was a trick all along. Just then, the lights come up and there's Castle himself standing in a dimly lit room surrounded by a team of about a dozen guards. As Cable steps up to confront him, they all break out into this weird ass 
Fox's Pinocchio-style dance routine, with Castle controlling each of the guards like the avatars in the game. On a giant screen, he reveals that they found the human space just moments after Cable left, and have already killed all of the hackers who they caught inside. Now it's time for the fight to start, and Castle's team of henchmen begin rushing him one after another as Cable systematically takes them all down in brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat. Although they outnumber him 10 to 1, these jabronis are no match for our man Cable here. And when he's done, he goes straight for Castle, but the man reminds him that he'll never find his daughter if he kills him now. Instead, he leads him to a basketball court where Hackman is hanging out shooting threes and reveals that he himself has the Nanix upgrades in his brain. But while everyone else is set up to receive commands, his is designed to give them, meaning that he can already control anyone who's had the procedure. With enough time, the Nanites will spread to people who never got the surgery at all, and then before they know it, he'll have the entire world under his control. As he wraps up his monologue, Hackman rushes at Cable from behind with a knife, but he easily overpowers him and breaks his neck in two different directions, finally killing him off. That's one more psycho down, but now it's time for a showdown with the boss. And that's when Cable realizes that Castle's team was able to reinstall the mind control once they found the human's base. This means that he can't fight back even if he wanted to, and the tech dork here starts beating his ass with kung fu moves in front of his own mind controlled family. After letting him have it for a minute, he's about to force Cable to go after his own family with the knife, but somehow Gina reactivates Simon's connection, and the kid is able to take over, commanding Cable to attack Castle instead, and putting them into a mental tug of war where they're both wrestling for control over his actions. Castle still manages to gain control, but that's when Cable comes up with the most genius plan of all, telling Castle to focus on the knife and imagine him stabbing it into his stomach. Castle tries to resist, but in the end, the intrusive thoughts win, and there's nothing that he can do as Cable and Simon stab him directly in the chest, ending his reign of terror once and for all. Thanks to Gina, the whole world saw what Castle really did, and now that the truth is out there, they finally realize just how evil his intentions were all along. Defeated. Castle's henchmen agree to deactivate Cable and his family's neural links, setting the three of them free. They may have lost a lot of friends along the way, but the family finally has justice for all of the ways Castle did them dirty, and they drive away into the countryside to start a new life off the grid, determined never to let Delia become an iPad kid if it's the last thing that they do. Gamer 2009. This is a fire movie. I actually remember to go see this in the theater when it came out, and I left pretty sad Satisfied. You know, this was like during the height of the Xbox Live era, and it seemed like they were able to get the Battle Royale concept uh, executed, at least for a Hollywood movie. There have been terrible Battle Royale examples in movies, you know, for years, but I, I feel like this movie nailed it, and I have to say that I appreciated them for pulling it off. Thank you so much for watching. Leave a like and subscribe, and check out the How to Beat playlist for more videos just like this one. I'm the guy. We'll see you in the next video, and have a damn good day.